I would like to introduce Dr. Robert Klitzman. Dr. Klitzman is professor of psychiatry at the College of Physicians and Surgeons and the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. He is also the director of the Bioethics Master's Program at the School of Professional Studies and co-founder of the Columbia University Center for Bioethics. Dr. Klitzman is joining us to discuss bioethics and the critical challenges and dilemmas we face. These dilemmas include engineering embryos and designing babies, genetic testing, epidemics of SARS, Ebola, and Zika, the possible over-medication of children, questions of when to turn off life support machines, and ongoing controversies about the Affordable Care Act. Dr. Klitzman will explain how, as patients, healthcare providers, or voters, these crucial questions affect us all. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Klitzman. Several years ago, I had the privilege of living in a Stone Age tribe in Papua New Guinea, studying cannibalistic rituals that had led to the spread of a disease called Kuru. It's a brain disease, and that we found several years later was the same as mad cow disease, but we didn't know that at the time. This was before mad cow disease existed. This is Papua New Guinea. It's located north of Australia, just to the east of Indonesia and south of the Philippines. Up until World War II, the center of New Guinea was thought to be uninhabited because no one had ever been there. There are very steep mountains and deep valleys with malaria. And during World War II, the Japanese decided that they wanted to take New Guinea to get to Australia, and suddenly there was a lot of warfare. Planes flew overhead and found that there were three million people living in the jungle of New Guinea, living in the Stone Age. And in 1956, Carlton Geideschek here decided that there are probably interesting diseases in primitive tribes around the world and started to go and look for them and study them. And the most famous one ended up being Kuru. It was affecting up to 90% of the women in the tribe, two thirds of the population. And he studied it and found that it was caused by what we now know are prions, but again, we didn't know that at the time. Uh, what we did know is uh, that it turned out to be traced to cannibalistic feasts. And so he sent me to study who ate who and how long it took for them to die. But what interested me most was that the people believed that the disease was caused by sorcery and could be cured by sorcery. And I got into long debates with them. They believed that a sorcerer would take your clothing or something that belonged to you and bury it, and they would wrap it around a stone, and they would cast, uh, put the stone in the ground, cast a spell on the stone, and they dig up stones, and they say, see this stone here? This is the stone that killed my mother. And I'd say, no, 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 Kuru's caused by a little thing like an insect. It's sort of alive. And they said, uh, really? Well, show it to us. And I said, well, you need a special machine to see it. And they'd say, well, what does it look like? And I'd say, well, we don't know. We hadn't yet identified it. And they'd say, well, have you seen it? And I'd say, no. And they said, that's just magic. It's a stone that killed my mother. And I was unable to convince them. Similarly, they thought that they had uh, healers who could cure the sorcery. And I'd say, well, who have you cured? And he'd say, well, all these guys I cured. And I'd say, well, anyone you didn't cure? And he'd say, yeah, that guy over there. And that guy was the one guy who I thought had the disease. These other people look normal to me. And I'd say, well, what's the treatment? And they said, well, for two weeks, I say that you're not allowed to drink water or eat salt or touch a member of the opposite sex and I give the person some herbs and I cast a spell on them. And I thought, well, should I stump him? I'd say, uh, well, why did anyone get sick? And he said, very simple, he didn't follow the treatment. He was not a good patient. I thought about these issues a few years later, however, when I was trained to be a psychiatrist. And I had a medical student at one point as a patient who was very stressed out by being in med school. She really didn't want to be there. Her parents had wanted her to be a doctor. And uh, she would talk about how stressed out she was, but wouldn't think very deeply about a lot of these issues. And I had a strict Freudian supervisor uh, who said, say nothing to her, get her to free associate. So I said nothing to her and she started to come late. She started to miss sessions. And my supervisor said, she's a no good Nick. She's failed the treatment and the treatment. And I felt that, again, it was the same kind of thinking that I had seen in New Guinea. 
And it made me wonder about how do we deal with failure when we as physicians uh, or as healers don't succeed in treating a patient and how it's easy to blame the patient rather than look at the larger issues of what we're doing. Uh, and I became interested in trying to understand the underlying assumptions that we make and to think critically about them in terms of why we do what we do and how we look at it. Similarly, when I trained uh, in medicine, uh, on my first day as an intern, I was given a list of patients and I walked in the door to see the first one and it was a woman who was sitting, eating her breakfast, eating her, cutting her grapefruit, I remember, and the sun was streaming in, we had a nice conversation. Uh, and then I walked out in the hall and my supervisor saw me, uh, my resident, and said, what have you been doing so far? And I said, well, I just spoke to Mrs. Jones. He said, she's dead, don't waste your time with the dead. I said, what do you mean she's dead? I just spoke with her. She's dead, don't waste your time with the dead. And in his mind, she had terminal cancer, she was labeled do not resuscitate, and it wasn't worth my time wasting my time with her. Then he turned to me and said, and besides, something just came down into the ER and we should go down and take a look. Something, a patient presumably, a person. And so I began to realize how important it was to look at the underlying human side of medicine, not just the science of what we're doing, but the assumptions we make uh, and the need to pay closer attention to the larger social, psychological, moral, cultural, and ethical issues involved in what we do in healthcare. And the field that looks at that is bioethics. Bioethics is a fairly new field, but it looks at the ethical, legal, social, cultural implications of advances in biotechnology and healthcare. And of course, there are an increasing number of issues in this area that we're all facing every day, whether we're patients, whether we're family members of patients, or whether we are uh, doctors or nurses or other healthcare providers, whether we're voters or taxpayers. We spend billions of dollars keeping people alive at the end of life. Uh, when they have no quality of life. And we only have so much money in the system, but we have increasing demands. Health care costs are going up, uh, and we can't afford to give everyone as much health care as they want. And so that leads to a lot of very difficult questions of who should get what. And underlying this are questions of how people make these decisions and how patients and doctors understand what they're doing in terms of what treatment they're giving to people and how we make sense of that. These issues came home to me a few years ago when my father was in the hospital. He developed leukemia, rising numbers of certain kinds of white blood cells in his body. And the doctors told us that there was no uh, known proven treatment, that he would die in six months. But he said there was an experimental chemotherapy that we could try as an experiment. And with that, there would be a 50% chance that he could live an additional six months to two years. My father didn't know what to do. My mother, who was uh, very realistic, said, um, let nature take its course. I, however, was a young doctor. I just trained in uh, medicine. I was convinced that science had answers for us still. Uh, and I encouraged him to try the experimental chemotherapy. And he did. And the last few months of his life were terrible. He was nauseous all the time. He was in pain. He said, if this is what life is, I don't want it. Uh, and it was a terrible last few months. Uh, and when he died, when I went to the hospital, the doctor came up to me in the hall and said, the experiment worked. The number of white blood cell counts had gone back to normal, but the patient died. And I was horrified. Had I made the wrong decision? Had I encouraged him to make the wrong decision? Uh, had I uh, pushed him the wrong way? And, and I suddenly realized what it was like to be on the other side of these decisions, to realize that, again, Whereas doctors may see the choices and the science in one way, that for family members and patients, it was very difficult to understand all the issues involved. I thought the doctor had been overly optimistic, that we didn't really understand and appreciate the risks involved, that his life could actually be worse for the next few months, as is what happened. So bioethics is the field that looks at these issues, at the ethical, legal, social implications of advances in healthcare and biotechnology. And there are four key underlying ethical principles. One is autonomy, uh, the respect for the individual. One is beneficence, that we should try to do good. 
One is non-maleficence, that we should avoid harming people. And the other is justice, a sense that we should do what's equitable for society as a whole. We shouldn't just be helping wealthy people at the expense of poor people, et cetera. And each of these has an interesting uh, history. Uh, uh, autonomy, for instance, uh, really came to a lot of attention, bioethics, as a result of what happened with the horrific Nazi experiments uh, during the Second World War. The Nazis, for instance, wanted to see how they could help their soldiers on the Eastern Front survive in the cold. So they decided they wanted to measure how long people could survive in the cold before dying, before freezing to death. And so they took people in concentration camps and put them in the cold and measured how long it took for them to die no informed consent, no respect for the individual having a say over what happens to his or her body. Yet these uh, concepts can also be quite difficult. So we all believe in justice, and yet people define justice very differently. So there are those who say with Obamacare, for instance, the Affordable Care Act, that justice is that we should give a certain amount of health care to everyone. There are others, however, who oppose that, who say justice is if I give more money, put more money into the system, I should get more, money, more out. And if I put less into the system, I should get less out. Others may say uh, that uh, justice is everyone gets the same. Whether you need a lot or a little care, you just get the same. Communism. But these principles can also compete. So with autonomy, for instance, there are those who say that we should allow people to buy and sell human organs. That if I have a kidney and I want to earn twenty, thirty thousand dollars by selling my kidney, I should. And if I'm a wealthy person, I want to buy a kidney, I should. We should let the marketplace rule. However, the problem with that is that what may well happen is that wealthy people may end up buying kidneys from poor people. And unfortunately, to sell a kidney may give you twenty, thirty thousand dollars one day. But there are complications that can occur. And we know that a lot of people in other countries, when they sell their kidneys, end up being disappointed with their decision when they look back. Somehow, what seemed like a lot of money manages to disappear quite quickly. Unfortunately, medical schools don't have much training in bioethics. They have some, and it's increasing, but it's still not a lot. I was fortunate to have some wonderful mentors who encouraged me. One was Renee Fox. Uh, Renee uh, is a professor at University of Pennsylvania. And unfortunately, when she was in college, she developed polio, uh, but became very interested in the sociology of medicine, in how a research ward and other medical wards are organized, what roles people have, what problems they have. Uh, she studied uh, people who survived heart transplants, for instance, in the world of heart transplants. Most recently, she wrote a book about Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, or MSF, looking at the kind of moral strains that they face as well. For instance, they may be able to go into a war-torn area, but the political leader will say that they can only go in that area to treat patients if they agree not to comment publicly on anything they see politically. That is, if they see genocide, if they see corruption, that they are not allowed to speak out about it. And so they face very difficult issues. Should we treat these patients but not be able to talk about the political issues? And they've often decided that as doctors, their role is to treat the patients and indeed not comment on the political issues. But these are difficult, controversial areas. Having become a patient myself at one point, I became interested in how other doctors look at these issues and how the experience of being a patient, being on the other side, may open the doctor up to understanding these issues more broadly. And so I ended up writing a book called When Doctors Become Patients, for which I uh, interviewed 75 doctors who became patients with serious illness. And what I found surprised me, gave me a lot of insights into these differences between how doctors and patients look at what they do and how we can make healthcare better. One surgeon, for instance, said to me that the night before he underwent surgery as a patient, his surgeon said to him, you know, there's a 5% chance you may die tomorrow in the operating room. And this surgeon said to me, you know, after he said that to me, that night I couldn't sleep. And it's only later that I realized that my surgeon could have said to me instead, you know, there's a 95% chance that everything should go OK. And the surgeon looked at me and said, you know, I've been a surgeon for 40 years, and I never realized that those two bits of information that are statistically the same have such different emotional meanings to a patient. I've never knew that, he said. I never realized it. That's the kind of stuff we don't teach in med school and need to. 
Similarly, a lot of these doctors said to me, you know, patients used to say to me, Doc, would you pray for me? And I'd go, yeah, yeah, and I'd poo-poo it. And it's only when I became a patient that I realized how important issues of meaning, of spirituality are when you're lying there facing the risk of death, facing your own mortality. And it wasn't until they became physicians themselves that they realized what it was like to be a patient in these ways. And again, these are kinds of insights that bioethics teaches, that bioethics encourage us to pay attention to in order to train doctors to be more sensitive to what it's like to be a patient and the broader problems that we all face in healthcare. Uh, so bioethics looks at a broad variety of issues, uh, and I've been privileged in the past few years to have developed and direct a master's of bioethics program here at Columbia, and we've uh, broken up the field into several areas that I think illustrate some of the richness and depth and importance of these questions. We look at the history of bioethics. So for instance, even after the Nazi experience that I described, when the Nuremberg Tribunal came up with a list of guidelines and ethical principles, they listed informed consent as being extremely important. And yet the US government in funding the Tuskegee syphilis study after that did not follow the principle of informed consent. The Tuskegee syphilis study looked at poor African-American men uh, who were semi-literate in the rural South they had syphilis, and the point of the experiment was to see how syphilis would slowly take over their bodies. The problem is that after World War II, when penicillin became available as an effective treatment for syphilis, the researchers decided not to tell the men about it or to offer it to them because it would destroy the experiment. And yet one would argue that uh, the men had a right to get the best treatment they can, that the researchers, the doctors should have had a, a, a commitment to notions of beneficence as well. And so uh, understanding how uh, history has shaped bioethics and how history has created a series of scandals often uh, in which people thought they were doing the right thing and in retrospect were not uh, is very important for understanding uh, the bioethical issues that we face today. There are also issues with uh, philosophy of bioethics that we look at, for instance, uh, we may say, for instance, that everyone deserves a certain amount of health care, but, but why do we do that? Uh, we don't say everyone deserves to drive a fancy car and the government will give that. We don't say everyone deserves to have a flat screen TV or an iPhone and we'll give everyone that. On the other hand, there are services where we think the government should uh, provide uh, for everyone. So, for instance, if your house is on fire, you don't want to call 911 and have the person at the other end say, well, what's your insurance? Uh, we're not gonna come and send the fire uh, department over unless we know you can pay for it first. And so we think of healthcare as being more like that, but why? Again, these are, are questions about what is health, what responsibility we have to each other. One controversial area in clinical ethics, for instance, concerns definitions of death. Because there's a shortage of organs to give to people who need them, it was decided that we should change the definition of death to develop brain death criteria. That is, if someone's having their heart and lungs working because of machines, but their brain is not working, we've decided that we can declare them dead and take out their organs to donate to others. And yet there are those who argue that because the heart and lungs are working, although with machines, that in fact we're taking organs out of people who are still alive. Clearly this is a controversial area. Another area is reproductive ethics. So with assisted reproductive technologies, we can now choose embryos. We can say uh, we only want to implant into a woman these embryos that don't have certain mutations and that maybe are only men uh, or only males. Uh, and we have now developed so-called CRISPR technology that lets us edit the genes of embryos. So in the future, people could say, I want these genes removed from the embryos. I want these ones put in. I want genes perhaps for blonde hair, blue eyes, and for height and musical ability. I don't want genes for these diseases there. And of course, this is expensive. And so it may be the case that in the future, wealthy people will be able to design babies, whereas poor people won't. And so perhaps in the future, there'll be diseases that increasingly will be diseases of the poor rather than affecting everyone. 
There are also issues in global bioethics. Uh, at this point, most biomedical research is actually funded by drug companies, not by the government. And most of that is conducted in the developing world. So just as our cell phones and computers are made in China or India or Malaysia or the Philippines, so too most drug company studies are conducted in these other countries. And yet in these other countries, there may be less regulation. Uh, the people may not really understand what they're getting involved in. They may not understand what research is. They may not understand that they could pull out of research at any point, et cetera. And there are a lot of issues involving ethics in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, increasingly, uh, there are cases where drug companies are trying to charge as much as they can for a drug, often hundreds of thousands of dollars a year per patient. And there are also instances where drug companies are paying doctors uh, to take patients who are doing well on a generic drug to switch the patient to a more expensive new drug that may in the end not be any better, rising the costs for all of us. So clue is a wide range of issues in bioethics that are important for all of us to understand as we move forward into the 21st century, because these are issues that ultimately affect all of us, whether we're patients, whether we're doctors, whether we are taxpayers, whether we are voters. Uh, and the more we can understand these issues, the more we can understand how healthcare is not just about science, but involve these broader human, ethical, social issues, the better off all of us will be. Thank you very much.